Hello and welcome to the Sheldrake Vernon Dialogues with myself, Mark Vernon and Rupert Sheldrake. Hi, Rupert. Hello, Mark. We get together every so often and start talking about something we've been thinking about separately to see where it takes us together and hoping very much that this sparks thoughts in our listeners and maybe even they have conversations too. And Rupert, today I wondered about talking around the issue of what the West can learn from the East, particularly in relation to spirituality, what the West can learn from the East. And I've, act I've landed on this because I've just been reading Rowan Williams's new book, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, which is called Looking East in Winter. And part of what he's getting at in the title there is that in the West, at least, it very much feels like we're in this period of crisis. Sometimes it's called the Anthropocene, where things like environmental degradation, the climate crisis and so on, are suggesting that not just we don't know what to do, but that we're in a spiritual crisis because we've become uncoupled from our roots. And so there's kind of runaway materialism in various forms, either ideologically or in terms of consumption. And in this book, part of what he's doing is looking in the first instance to Eastern Christianity, but also further East as well, to, as he says, seek an epiphany about reality, as opposed to just trying to search for a new ideology or come up with a program that would fix things. He, he's arguing that we've got to a point where we need to dig more deeply. And so this really intrigued me, this idea that there may be things that we got to learn from the East in terms of how we experience life, you know, how we perceive the nature of reality, which of course is so different when you move even into the Middle East, let alone into the Indian subcontinent. And I know that this is an area which you have a lot of direct experience of too, and you've even thought about in relation to science. So that, that, that makes some sense to you as a subject. Well, yes, I mean, it's such a huge subject. That's the only problem with it, of course. Um, I mean, I, it's a, something I've been very interested in for a long time. As you know, I lived in India for seven years and I lived in Malaysia for a year before that. So I spent eight years of my life living in Asia. And the reason I did that was because I was very drawn to Asian cultures and, and um, also living in the tropics. Um, and part of the, my time in India, two years of that, uh, of, of the seven years in India uh, was spent in the ashram of Father Bede Griffiths um, who wrote a book called The Marriage of East and West and part of his life's work really was this combining or bringing together perspectives from Eastern spirituality and Western spirituality and his ashram was an Indian style ashram and he wore orange robes like Hindu holy men um, the, uh, there was yoga and meditation as an integral part of the, the ashram. Uh, and uh, it was really an attempt to learn from um, Eastern traditions, particularly Hindu, but also Buddhist and Muslim and Sikh and Jain. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And also uh, find a way of integrating them also, when I was living in South India, um, I, when I was in um, Chennai, I used to stay at the Theosophical Society headquarters, and which was, was by far the nicest place to stay in Chennai. It has acres and acres of beautiful grounds with old trees and, and very nice spacious buildings. Um, and the Theosophical Society, it, founded in the late 19th century, was all about learning from Eastern traditions. And one of the things they did was help to introduce meditation to the West. They also introduced cremation. Now it's absolutely standard. Most people in Britain get cremated, but it was wildly eccentric in the late 19th century and, and barely legal. Um, so they, they had a long, um, it started a long process of learning from the West and uh, learning from the East. And I would say that um, this has become a massive movement now. I mean, 18 million people in the United States alone meditate on a regular basis. Yoga is now taught 
all over the place. And uh, one could argue that many of these Oriental influences permeate our lives, uh, whether we're aware of it or not, including vegetarianism, which has long been part of um, the Hindu and Jain traditions. Um, and these things are all much influencing our day-to-day -day lives here. Um, so I think it's an enormous topic, yes. And I mean, if you had to land on one element that either drew you in the first instance or you think has substantially, you know, even revolutionised your perception of reality, if there were one key way of seeing things or doing things or um, sense of things that you've you found when you went east could could you say would there be one well i suppose it would be the more most obvious thing really would be the exploration of consciousness from within um when i was i raised in the christian tradition at home and at school um there wasn't much emphasis on the inner life if you like there were prayers certainly and there was music and a lot of emphasis on helping other people, which I think is very important, uh, but very little on just sitting quietly and uh, exploring the, the mind and the, the spiritual realm uh, from within. Um, of course, I later found from Father Bede and others that this was indeed part of the Christian contemplative tradition and was far better developed in the Eastern Church than in the Western Church, in, in the Orthodox Church, the Jesus Prayer and other uh, spiritual practices, as in um, the Philokalia, that great collection of Orthodox texts on the prayer of the heart and similar practices. Um, so I think that was the thing that interested me most, that, that people had spent years of their lives um, exploring the realms of consciousness, the nature of the mind, and the relation of mind and body. And of course, yogis and um, the whole practice of yoga is not just about suppleness of limbs and looking younger and moving more gracefully and that sort of thing. And it's often treated as, uh, for, as if it's a purely physical practice, uh, but the way in which they relate the physical practice of yoga, the control of breathing through pranayama, um, to consciousness, the relation of the mind and the body and consciousness. These were all things that I had never learned about in the West and which I really wanted to learn about um, in India. And of course, they're also part of Buddhist traditions in, in, uh, in Thailand, Burma, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Japan, and, and of course, Tibet. Yeah, I mean, elsewhere. In, um... The word that comes to mind there actually is the word participation and how we learn about ourselves, the world, others, and other realms too, by participating in their life and knowing their life as part of our lives. And so that takes you immediately on this inward turn and how working on yourself, developing your sense of yourself and your consciousness and realizing that there's a whole lot more to it than just perhaps what you're immediately used to is not just to go on a kind of trip, but actually is to navigate and explore different parts of reality. Um, I've just been reading about around the Advaita Vedanta and a first point that this book I'm reading made is that if you're in search of Brahman, the kind of ultimate reality in Advaita Vedanta terms, the first thing you have to realize is that that Brahman is you, is in you. And so understanding yourself and in the first instance, what excludes you from that perception of Brahman, whether it be things like desiring other objects or seeking things like fame, um, but then also how, what qualities of mind you habitually use. These are all crucial things to consider and to develop in order that then this wider reality can even start showing up for you. And in fact, Rowan Williams picks up on this because he talks about how one of the things he thinks Western Christianity needs to learn is that aligning with divine life is a key 
skill almost that we need to recover. You know, Western Christianity is often told in terms of a story of, I don't know, maybe rescue, how we've fallen away from God. And as it were, God does something from the outside in to restore relationship. And, you know, that's one way of talking about it. But he is saying that in the Eastern Christian tradition, and particularly the Philokalia, actually, which he talks a lot about, um, it's like a whole series of practices that remove the veils or the ignorances, the things that obscure what enables you to see divine life more and more clearly, and then to participate in divine life, which is this constant flow of giving and receiving um, of um, expansion, um, stepping into the limitless, into the infinite, even as you yourself are participating from a particular viewpoint, you know, in the Christian tradition, you're an incarnation of the divine, um, prototypically in the figure of Jesus, but he's arguing that's what we need to recover to as well. So it's very interesting how he's, I think, seeking to refresh Western understandings by drawing on Eastern, in the first instance, Christian understandings, but um, that feels very much like it draws on the Indian understandings that you're talking about as well there, around this theme of participation, as opposed to say maybe analyzing or studying or you know objectivizing reality. Now there's, you know, there's advantage in that and the scientific tradition um, very much um, makes the most of that, um, but it can exclude as much as um, bring to light truths about things. Yes. Yes, well, I think this participation is 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 very important, and, and I was very fascinated when I discovered that a major part of the theology of the Eastern Orthodox traditions is theosis. God became human so that humans could become divine, um, and the the idea that Jesus created the precedent and opened the way for a divinization of humans. Now it's a, different from the fall and redemption pattern, you know, where sinners need saving. Um, it's a divinization pattern and it's one that's obviously a key part of the life of Jesus himself. When he has his first recorded mystical sense of unity or connection with God at the moment of his baptism, um, um, then there's this clear sense of connection with the divine being, participation. And his own spiritual life involved long periods going into the hills to pray and withdrawing from the crowds to pray. I mean, there's many mentions of that in the New Testament. So it's clear he had a strong inner life. It wasn't all about social action. I mean, there was social action, there was healing and all sorts of things like that. But um, the, the inner life was clearly uh, absolutely central to what he was personally doing. And I think in the Eastern church, this emphasis on theosis, the, the divinization of humanity, it gives this much more positive take on the Christian tradition. And I saw this very strongly when I went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land with a church group from London, it was actually from St. Bartholomew the Great. And the vicar who was leading our group was friendly with the Greek Orthodox Archbishop of Jerusalem. And he took us into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And when we got to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, he said, you know, there's a difference between our traditions. And there we were at the Holy Sepulchre. He said, you call it the um, Holy Sepulchre, the tomb of Jesus. We call it the place of resurrection, Anastasia, the resurrection. Um, and it's also the same if you go to Orthodox churches. One of the most common images in those Byzantine mosaics is Christ in glory, Christ in the dome and mosaics where he's there in, in glory up above you, surrounded by gold, the resurrected Christ, the representing this divine life. Whereas Christian church, oh, Catholic churches especially, um, uh, have Jesus on the cross being crucified. So they're two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other, but it's interesting that the Western churches have emphasized the suffering, the crucifixion, and the Eastern churches have emphasized the resurrection and the divine life 
um, that is made possible in the Christian view through the divinization of Jesus. Yeah, I figure like David Bentley Hart, who I know we both read and engage with, he would say that's in part because Eastern Christianity has kept in touch with its Platonic roots, um, the traditions arising from Plato, which incidentally is also traditions arising from the East, because I think a lot of ancient Greek philosophy was very open to ideas coming from the East through, say, the ancient Silk Roads, and then subsequently from the exploits of Alexander the Great, when he opened up those roots even more so. Um, and, that, and that Platonic idea, I think, is very powerful. Um, I mean, you, you see it in Eastern Orthodox churches um, in another image that's very common, which is the image of the Virgin with a figure of the Christ in her womb. And actually, this can often be um, the, the main figure um, when it's not the Christ in glory, as you say, um, at the east end of the church. And you have to hunt, hunt quite a lot to find a, a figure of the cross. And what this symbolizes for me is that the divine life is constantly pouring creation out of itself, a kind of emanation. And the Platonic idea would be that the core of reality is not just being itself, but is also a kind of blissful, excessive overpouring of beauty and goodness too. It can't but help to constantly expand into new and endless varieties. And that this is seen in the figure of Mary, who is both born of that emanation, but also bears it within herself. So she both is enwombed by the divine love, but also in her own womb bears it too. And so Mary becomes a type for divine life for us, this theosis for us, um, that we can, as it were, know it welling up within ourselves, even as we know that we're a product of its welling up in creation too. So I love that kind of dynamic sense of things that um, it's a constant kind of giving and receiving, um, which again, in Christian terms would be envisaged in the life of the Trinity. This is why Christianity has the, the idea of the Trinity, that there can't be a kind of static monad that's the source and ground of all things, because that wouldn't really go anywhere, it wouldn't do anything. Instead, it has this part of its very life is to give forth, and that gives first giving forth to itself, as it were, in, in the Christian tradition would be called the word that reflects back the source. But that very reflection is the divine life as well. So you have the spirit being born um, at the same time. Um, yeah, so I, I, I feel very drawn to the idea that theosis, divinization, is sensing into more and more how we're part of that life. And it, when you kind of start to try and contemplate it, get a real feel for it. It almost gives a moment by moment sort of orientational direction. Um, I mean, even, you know, when, when you try and speak about it, um, rather than sort of lecturing about it or reasoning about it or getting stuck in the logic of three in one, which can often happen, how can we speak about it so you actually feel that expansion in the words that we try and utter, um, that are a mirror of the divine word? Um, in, in, in his book, Rome Williams talks about the philosopher who inspires you, not because you feel they've pinned something down, but because their words make you want to know what they're talking about. They stir up the spirit within you or the artist whose work doesn't just kind of capture something in an instant, but opens something up for you and takes you somewhere further. Um, you know, a kind of Van Gogh that never means you never see a cornfield again um, or a sunflower again or a sunset again. Um, so I love that participation and theosis divinization idea. Um, we, and it, it, it's, it's good news. Maybe that's something which the West also needs at this time is uh, for all that there is suffering and there really is, the good can't quite ever let us go. That maybe is another message from the East as well. Yes. I think the... Um within the Holy Trinity, the, the most platonic part is, is, is I suppose, the, the logos, the word, which is this realm of forms and uh, ideas in Plato, but also the ground of being that sustains them. The dynamical principle, the spirit, is, I suppose, implicit in Plato in the outpouring of, of the, um, the world, or the, the universe, the creation. 
Um, but I find the doctrine of the Holy Spirit particularly helpful because what it's telling us is that this sort of energy of the entire creation that flows through everything, what in science we call energy, um, which is the principle of change, movement, actuality, um, is in all things. I mean, as David Bohm said, matter is frozen light. Light is moving energy. Um, Matter itself is vibratory energy, as quantum theory shows us. It's not just passive stuff. Um, everything involves this flow of energy. And again, the Eastern Orthodox theology of the spirit is, I think, uh, very helpful here. When I was on a, a, a floating conference going around the back Black Sea, which was co-sponsored by the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew, and the European Commission Minister for the Environment or Commissioner for the Environment. It was about religion, science and ecology. And we went round the Black Sea and as we went round, we picked up patriarchs wherever we went, the patriarch of Georgia and Romania and Bulgaria. And um, we, we met with the patriarch of Moscow and or Russia. And um, so, and these patriarchs had a a, a conclave on this ship to come up with a joint statement about theology and the environment. And instead of taking years, like most church councils take, they only took a few hours, and they came up with a very impressive statement saying that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is the breath of life in all nature, the creative breath of life in all nature, not just in human beings and in speaking through the prophets and so on and in Jesus, but throughout the whole of nature, the energy, the life, the flow of life in all nature is divine. And therefore, um, despoiling the environment is a sin against the spirit. And so they came up with very clear and very helpful uh, theology of the environment and for environmentalism. Um, again, uh, emphasizing that aspect of the Holy Spirit, which is rather played down in the Western church, um, churches, I should say, because um, the Roman Catholic church and its derivatives, like Anglicanism, Methodism, and all these other, they're all have come out of the Western Catholic tradition. Um, they tend to play down this, this idea of the spirit of God living in all nature. And I think that's why this extreme perversion uh, took place in the 17th century with the mechanistic worldview, uh, where in the foundations of mechanistic science, nature was seen as entirely mechanical, totally devoid of life. And the realm of the spirit was withdrawn from nature. So God and the angels and human minds are outside nature. They're um, unextended, uh, not in time and space. Whereas everything in time and space, the material world is unconscious, mechanical, and the whole of Western science ever since then has been based on this view. With the materialist revolution in the 19th century, God angels and uh, sort of human spirits uh, were wiped out, uh, leaving only unconscious matter. And that is of course materialism and mechanistic materialism is still the dominant orthodoxy of the sciences, even though in many parts of the world, most scientists don't believe it for a moment. They go along with it during working hours. In India, for example, I soon found that the great majority of Indian scientists are normal religious Indians, They're Hindus, Muslims, Jains, Sikhs, uh, Parsis. Um, they're not um, mechanistic, materialist, atheists at all. Um, and yet they have to go along with a Western derived worldview, which still dominates the sciences um, and has this extremely reduced view of consciousness. The whole universe is devoid of consciousness, no divine consciousness within and beyond nature, no divine consciousness in anything, uh, but somehow consciousness mysteriously emerging as an epiphenomenon or as some, uh, an illusion that does nothing inside human heads and possibly animal heads as well such a truncated view, um, which is why uh, we've gone so far in that extreme direction that I think we have so much to learn from traditions in Eastern Christianity and in Eastern spirituality in general. About yeah, I, I, it really is a sort of religious mistake 
as well as um, a truncated scientific methodology. Because I've been reading um, a biography of Martin Luther recently by Linda Roper, and she talks there about how, first of all, Luther felt he couldn't find satisfaction within himself and so turned to the Bible as a kind of object to seek some sort of security outside of himself, which was a completely new idea that up to that point, the Bible itself had been seen as inspired, not because the words on the page were somehow fixed by the Holy Spirit, but that the Spirit spoke to you through the words on the page and became allegorical, became symbol, stirred up thoughts and feelings and so on inside you. Luther rejected that because he didn't really trust his inner life. And there's even a story that Luther one day was caught in a thunderstorm. And in the medieval mind, thunderstorms with their raging were sympathetically connected to the raging even of the devil himself. And so were very frightening for that experience. And Luther feared, apparently for the rest of his life, Linda Roper writes, that he might have been possessed by that thunderstorm and could never quite shake off the sense. And this then seeded the idea that inner life is not to be trusted. If anything, it's devilish. Um, and that then becomes it's dead in the modern world, um, a mere epiphenomena that really has no content, no value, truthfulness in itself. Um, and then you get the other strand coming in with John Calvin, who has his own story about how human life is totally depraved. Um, and so you need, again, these kind of objective sources of authority that moves into the scientific revolution. And so, you know, maybe that kind of that almost digression in terms of how we engage with reality is beginning to exhaust itself for all that the good it's brought, you know, I mean, that's the trouble in a way that it, it at the same time brought quite a lot of technological power. And in fact, people like Francis Bacon argued that putting technological power into human hands through the scientific revolution was how God was going to restore us to a lost Eden because we could make the material world work for us again, rather than be at enmity with it, as he read in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve were expelled from Eden. But I guess we're increasingly seeing the falsity of that vision because we're using the material world to exhaustion in trying to build perfect lives for ourselves. And so we have, I think, increasingly to make this inward turn again and the East can inspire us. And as you said right at the beginning, has been actually inspiring us. It's been kind of coming in through meditation, through yoga, through vegetarianism and so on for quite some time now anyway, filling up this kind of loss. Yes, and also through the... Um recovery of a sense of the life of nature. Um, many people through romantic poetry and through the romantic movement in the late 18th, early 19th century, um, turn back to the sense that nature is indeed alive, not just dead and mechanical. And that there's something in the natural world that we can participate in, uh, rather than just seeing nature as something to be conquered by humans. And, as Bacon said, uh, the aim of science and technology was to extend the empire of man over the universe. It was an imperialist model for conquering nature and, and dominating it and exploiting it. Um, but the Romantic movement provided a counterpoint to that, which is very important in many Western people's lives. There's a split about nature. The, in leisure time and e evenings and weekends and holidays, nature's alive, but during working hours, it's just mechanical and there to be exploited. So uh, I think we're also learning from not only Eastern traditions like the Hindu tradition, where they have all these sacred trees and sacred animals like sacred cows and monkeys and things and banyan trees and pea palm trees, tulsi plants, uh, so many sacred plants and animals in the sense of the spirit at work in nature. Nature is a manifestation of the divine, not inert and totally separate from us. Um, uh, we're getting a, uh, that was, uh, is also part of the shamanic worldview all over the world. Before the great world religions, there were hunter-gatherer societies and it's usually assumed that most of them had kind of shamanic figures relating to the natural world. And the 
pre prevailing assumption there was that natural world is alive and it has various degrees of consciousness and there are spirits and there are beings that we can relate to and participate with. Um, and of course, in the Middle Ages here in Europe, that was the case as well. Um, the prevailing philosophy was a kind of Christian animism. Um, the, the earth was Mother Earth, the stars and planets were living beings with intelligences. People were not living in a dead, impersonal, mechanical world in medieval Europe. Uh, they were living in a world that gave rise to the great Gothic cathedrals, which were bursting with life forms and you know, foliage and so on, and the columns are like trunks of trees. And, um, so that is also being recovered at the moment through the rise of panpsychism in philosophy and also through neo-shamanism. Yeah, I mean, you get it in Dante, um, you know, when you mentioned the, um, the medieval mindset. And I think Dante wrote the Divine Comedy because he began to sense that something was going wrong with that perception that life participates in the divine. You know, he lived during the period that's sometimes called the first industrial revolution in the 13th century, um, when modern forms of monetary support, modern mercantile practices and so on were starting to emerge, particularly in Florence, you know, where he lived, the great banks being established. And he feared this would uncouple us from spiritual reality. And so I think in part what he's doing when he encounters people in the inferno in hell is that they're living in a reality that has become dead and mechanical and depersonalized. They're trapped. And then as he moves through purgatory, and particularly in paradise, his, his journey in paradise is, in a way, more and more developing his virtues, not so that he becomes a better person, so that his behavior changes, although it does, but because he realizes that as he, for example, knows what beauty is more by acting more beautifully himself, speaking more beautifully himself, that is because he can perceive things more beautifully. And so that actually connects him more and more closely with reality. Um, and so it be, again, it becomes a kind of program. Virtue is a kind of epistemology, you might say, not um, a, another form of morality. And um, because of this participative way that we know things, um, we tune in, we harmonize, we resonate. Um, and that, has this kind of opening up quality and um, rather than the standing back view from nowhere, which um, can so dominate. But as you say there, that the romantics were definitely onto as well. Um, they sought ways of speaking through poetry, through arts that enabled that, that to, sort of, to remember in a way that older way, but remake it new, I think, for the modern world. Um, it's, it's good, I think, always to, identify where the East is present in the West, um, because then you can make it part and parcel of your life here and now, and um, as well as looking elsewhere for inspiration, um, because you don't want to be alienated from your here and now, because um, that is another way of sort of trying to stand apart and, and, and negate, um, whereas to be able to see how we can engage with life through the traditions that hold on to this older way of seeing things, but inspired by Eastern practices, Eastern philosophies that still do it, as it were. Um, that combination feels really important. I think it's important for the East as well as the West. I think it would be wonderful if public policies in India, China and elsewhere were inspired by Eastern philosophies. Um, they're very much inspired by Western philosophies at the moment, um, you know, exploitative capitalism. Um, in the case of China, the official philosophy is still atheistic Marxism based on dialectical materialism. So it's a materialist worldview, which is the official worldview in China. And I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens if there's a greater attention in China itself paid to it, the Taoist tradition, the Buddhist tradition. Uh, the government there is rather in becoming increasingly in favor of the Confucian tradition, which teaches respect for authority. And of course, they're awfully keen on respect for authority. Um, but uh, the, I don't know much about what's happening in China now, but from what one reads, it doesn't seem that the Taoist view of the interflow of nature and the yin and the yang and the actual organic quality of nature 
has much influence on uh, industrial policy um, or the way they um, construct their a rather capitalist society. Well, look, maybe um, maybe the Darius tradition will be something we could pick up on at the future point, because in a way we have talked more, I guess, about Indian and then the Orthodox traditions now. I mean, just on that, I'm, I'm a, a bit friendly with uh, Martin Palmer, who has translated actually a lot of Darius texts and has also at various points worked in China. But I think he's seen a kind of cycle where after the Cultural Revolution, um, which destroyed a lot of these traditions and the temples and the texts and so on, there was an attempt to reinvigorate particularly Darius traditions. But I think it's turning again now um, and it's in another quite destructive, negative phase. Um, that's certainly my sense from talking with him. Um, but maybe we could pick that up at a future point. Um, you know, these themes of participation, divinization, um, they're, they're good, rich ones, and uh, it's lovely to turn them over with you. And hopefully that inspires some of our listeners too, um, to, um, you know, be stirred up um, from what they know or want to discover. Both stirred up and also perhaps a little sitting quietly or being quiet and uh, as well. Um, yes, I think that's it. And I think it's another way of putting it just to, to sort of help wrap this up is, is a greater sense of the imminence of the spirit uh, within nature and within us in the East. And uh, the West has had an excessive, I think, emphasis on the transcendence of the spirit beyond not within. Um, and, and and so, yes, I think these are all things that not only do we need to learn, but, but actually that we are learning and on a surprisingly large scale at the moment. Well, on that hopeful note, um, we'll draw to a close there. Fall into silence, indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. Cheers, thank you.